Tonight, we invited the writer of the worst Star Wars production of all time to be on our show, but he was too busy working on Knives Out 2. So instead, we got something much better. Woo! Guys. Yes, I approve. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, the weirdest, coolest Christmas special of all time graced our TV screens and has since weirdly become a cult classic. It was the Star Wars Christmas special of 1978, and one of the writers of that special, the one, the only, Bruce Blanche, is here to fill us in on just what the heck was going on. Welcome to the Con Guy podcast here. Thank you. Or we yeah. should say, Bruce. Hey, there. Hello. Hello, Con Guys. <laughs> this is, uh, this is quite Con weird. Guys I've ever met. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As well, always, you me these the chains with the other one. <laughs> Join the club. As I'll always, you're on that hashtag show network. Character actors. I'll just sit here like this. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. My name is Jim Fry. I am kind of the uh, Whoopi Goldberg of the con guy here, I guess you could say. First, I'd like to hear who else we have with us today. Luke, introduce yourself. I'm uh, Cheeseman here. One of the con guys, one of the founding members, and uh, drinking some eggnog on this hap- happy Ooh. hour. Got a little brandy in this thing. So cheers, Good. everyone. Good. All right. Derek. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm kind of the angry old embittered veteran of the group, maybe. I don't know. But I was a founding member of the con guy. I am drinking um, cherry tea with a dash of cinnamon. Oh, man. Mm. I remember her. Mm. <laughs> Danae, what about you? Hi, everybody. I'm Danae. I'm here. Um, Katie's not with us tonight, so I guess I'm the only girl on the show. That's weird. Uh-huh. Um, but it's nice to be here. Only girl. What, what? And I yeah. guess, does that make me Big Bird? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. I'll, I'll be the I'm other excited. girl. <laughs> and then I'll be the wing girl. <laughs> there you go. Hey, everybody. It's me, old buddy Ben Cleaver. Uh, tonight, out of my red cup, I am drinking. Actually, I got sustainable red cups now. These are dishwasher safe. <laughs> so I'm not throwing one away every night. Uh, I made myself a little margarita because yeah. it's Tuesday. Yeah. That's right. Fully functional for beer pong. Right hey, on. Ben, who, hey, Ben, who's your sponsors? Oh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. I forgot. This is an official show. This isn't just the happy hour. This is the Con Guy show, not our live happy hour, even though this is still live and it's basically the same thing, except we have a guest, Bruce Valange, who's awesome and amazing. But this yeah. tonight's show is brought to you by Neft Vodka, uh, which reminds you always drink spo- uh, responsibly. There's uh, <laughs> Also brought to you by uh, Death Wish Coffee. Uh, fair trade, highly caffeinated, the world's strongest coffee. If you go to deathwishcoffee.com right now and you use the code hashtag show, uh, you can get 10% off your order. So mm. there you go. And of course, our amazing guest tonight, he is a comedy writer, a songwriter, an actor, and I think I have this right, a six-time Emmy Award winner. His name Ooh. is Bruce Blanche. He is a he's well known to the public for his awesome time on Hollywood Squares as a celebrity participant and head writer for the show. His super super duper long resume we can't go through all that. It, it includes like fifty Academy Awards, thirty Emmy shows, all the Tony shows, Comic Relief, People's Choice. Not to mention the film Don't Mess with the Zohan, starring Adam Sandler. Tonight he is here to take us back to 1978, the Star Wars special. And uh, we're going to fill him in a little bit on this year's Lego Star Wars specials, too. Bruce, what are you drinking tonight, my friend? Fanta juice. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a, a Joan Crawford diet Snapple, which means it's got as much vodka as it possibly can have in it. <laughs> <laughs> can I tell you, I've been looking forward to, to this for a long time. I, 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 used, I grew up on the Hollywood Squares, and I used to watch you on the Hollywood Squares. You were so funny. I didn't know that oh, you yeah. were a writer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, when they when they brought it back and they said we were comedy in it, they may be the head writer. So uh, and and it was booked with people who were were funny as much as possible. Good and Whoopi was in the center square, so uh, so it was uh, and, you know they, and they they put me on there basically to tame her. They thought that <laughs> they thought that you know I mean I, uh, I they made me they made me audition. She thought I should host it, so they tested me. You know, and there are but this one's for the win, Kevin. 
And it, they said, you're not, you're, you know, we need a bit more mainstream. And then Bergeron came in. But mm. so they put me in a square and they thought that uh, I would calm her down. But, but they didn't realize that she is really a, a Jewish kid and I am really a black woman. <laughs> Which, ask anybody who slept with me, they will tell you. <laughs> uh, we bonded very well. I mean, I worked with Bobby for years before that on a lot of different things, and uh, we 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 bonded in our squares. We had a great time, but it was a lot of lunatics. Gilbert Gottfried and and oh, yeah. Caroline Ray and Brad Garrett, and there were a lot of the, the regulars that kept coming up every week, were out of their minds. So we had a good time. <laughs> I can't believe that's not on anymore. Like, I mean, we could use something like that. Well, it may come back. It's on uh, VH1 as Hip Hop Squares. Uh -huh. The original Squares owners sold it to Viacom as a show because rappers are so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick Cannon posted the first show and walked off. And I don't know who's on it now, but it's like Flavor Flav rules because he's the funny one. And then the other ones are all, I mean, you know, they're doing material from 20 years ago. It's, it's just very sad. But um, <laughs> once that goes away, they might, they might try to reboot. You know, the thing about Hollywood Squares is it never, it was always a hit. It never went away. Those yeah. other shows that rebooted were hits the first time, and then they bombed whenever they tried to reboot. So now they're finally, they're like new. People are discovering match game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, Bruce, but, you know, we, we've just never been, you didn't have to discover us. We were always there. And it was, I just did the last. I wrote for the first show for Paul Lind towards the end of the run. Yeah. And, then, really? and then I wrote the second version for Joan Rivers and Waylon Flowers. And, oh, wow. and then, I, then I came in and did the third one. That's more the history than you want to know about Hollywood Squares. Oh, my gosh. Talk about intimidating. You were a writer for Paul Lind and Joan Rivers. I mean, that's. No, that's I know. Weird. Exactly. And I had to tell them apart, which was very difficult. <laughs> as, as Joan kept, you know, getting getting new faces every time she came in, more and more like a Yorkshire Terrier every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a tradition on the show. The tradition is for first time guest Derek, yeah. con guy Derek, puts him through a very rigorous interview process, which he's going oh, to baby. do. Right now. Oh my God. And it lasts for a whole minute, and I'm going to pull up yeah. the minute clock. So here. Jim's going to give us a timer, and I'm going to ask you a number of hard-hitting questions. And the, the trick is to just not really think about it, just answer it quickly. And um, if you get through um, all 20 of these questions, then you win the prize. Oh, um, The prize is that I declare you my new best friend. Yay. <laughs> all right. Yay. I've got a lot of new best I friends. Need, I don't have enough Derricks in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm not there, you definitely don't. Argument. All right, guys. All right. You about ready, Jimmy, Derek? I, I am so ready. Five, four, three, two, go. Okay, iPhone or Android? Uh, Android. Uh, best speedster, Flash or Quicksilver? Best speedster what? Uh, best said, speedster. You said it fast. I don't know what it was. Pass. Flash or Quicksilver? Pass. I don't know those. Just That's okay. Uh, here's this. Which is worse, a xenomorph in the kitchen or a sarlacc in the toilet? I have no idea. Anything <laughs> in the toilet is pretty bad. Okay, good answer. Uh, which golden girl would you most like to buy a drink from? <laughs> oh, B. B. Arthur. Okay, which golden girl would you most like to buy a drink for? Estelle, because she'd be hysterical after two of them. <laughs> ah, ditto. Uh, what's the best Star Wars? The best Star Wars? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the one with uh, um, Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Jar Jar Binks. Uh, what's your favorite starship? My favorite what? Starship. My favorite starship? Enterprise. That's all I can think of. One more. <laughs> Excellent answer. <laughs> oh, that's a minute. That's a minute. That's a minute but, but I like his answer. I have part of the round not understanding. Yeah, it's okay. I was talking to Matt. Right? Nobody else has ever done that, Bruce. Everybody takes it seriously. Everybody takes it very seriously because these are hard hitting. This is hard hitting journalism here. I don't know. Um, What's the, well, I, we got eight of what them. What was the, the Quicksilver and something else? It sounded what like the Long Range Flash. The Long Range Horses. Horses. I have no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> My bad. Troglodyte, you know. I, I barely okay. know that I have an Android. So uh, really, really fast running superheroes. Flash is the one from the DC universe and Quicksilver is the one from oh, Marvel. Oh, 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 that was what that was. Mm -hmm. that, I dated the Flash for a while, but we can't talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did you say about Jar Jar Binks? He looks like Barbara Streisand. 
them together, you'll see. Amazing. Oh, okay. She is a faithful replica of Jar Jar Binks now. <laughs> oh, you know, people, people run away with the work, is what I'm saying. <laughs> they, they need to put like a break on it to say that's it, this and no more. <laughs> All right. Before we talk Star Wars, because I think that's what most people are pro probably here for today. Wait, let me get in the comments though, real quick. Chins are gone now. Yeah. I look like Job of the Hood. I'll do this. Yeah. I'm auditioning right. for Job of the Hood. Let's say, if he ever comes back. Jonathan Wilkerson. Glad hey, to Jonathan. see you. Here's John. And then also Cat Bloodgood. Good to see you. I always love that name. She's All got right. the best name of anyone who shows up in the comments. So guys, before we before we talk about uh, Star Wars tonight, I want to talk a little bit about Amy's career prior. I mean, after Star Wars, for example. Before we talk about, can we talk a little bit about the thousand other things that you've done? How many Oscar shows right. have you written? Well, twenty three that I was credited on, credited on. Sorry, there was dental work today. Credited, um, and then about a lot of others. I mean, that I came in and wrote for people individually. But I was twenty three of them, and, and we used to uh, toss the head writer uh, a credit around. And I was a head writer on a bunch of those. And I was a regular writer. I was a special material. You know, they have a million different ways of uh, of short stiffing you for <laughs> the money. <laughs> Give you a different title, less money, but different title. Well, can you tell us what that's like, like writing for the Oscars, like the biggest yeah. show on the planet? Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like if, you, if you're if you a football player, you want to be in the Super Bowl. And for the kind of stuff that I do, which is writing you know, jokes for people and things for people to say a lot at the presentation, uh, it's it's the, the biggest of one of them all. So it's it's uh, terrifying, but it's also just a lot of fun knowing that there that anything you say will, will echo through the corridors of time. <laughs> that yeah. there, if you really screw up badly enough, it'll be, it'll be all over the place forever. Uh, and, and it's, I mean, I, I watched it when I was a kid and it was like so glamorous. I wanted to be a part of it. And, and I had no idea that I would be you know, backstage. I mean, I would someday be on stage stepping over dog shit that last, that, that, that uh, um, the, be, the dog, uh, the, the bloodhound had left, uh, Beethoven. <laughs> I would be guiding Deborah Carr over a pile of turds as we were, you know. <laughs> Boy, glamour. I That's wanted good. it. I wanted it. I sat there in Jersey going, take me. Now, what were some of the favorite like lines of the Academy Awards you wrote that were presented by some of these famous actors? Wow. Um <clears throat> I remember some of the jokes. I mean, uh, yeah. uh jokes. Actually, I remember the jokes that we that we didn't do. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I want to hear about tell that. you that. My favorite was, was Steve Martin. Uh, the first time he hosted, um, we had a joke. He was going to come out after the monologue, the commercial, and then he would come back out and he would say, "I have good news and bad news." Uh, the um, the uh, uh, during the monologue, my my fly was open the entire time. The the good news is. Uh, <laughs> I, I fucked it up. But <laughs> <laughs> the good news is the camera puts on 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it totally in so long. I forgot. I forgot. And and at the last minute, he backed out. He said, he, he just put, mm. it's a cock joke. And I convinced him it was a camera joke. <laughs> and he said, no, no, it's a cock joke. We can't do it. But, uh, I, you know, I mean, I think it was, when I think about the about the lines now, it's that it's they're also they they have little shelf life. Timely. They refer off of things that are happening that night or that year in the movies or something like that. And so it's it's uh, that's why I can't think of anything. That and probably I'm coming off the of nitrous oxide. <laughs> I'm having yeah, a little, little jaw work. Fun afternoon. Oh wait, it, it was a fun afternoon. I was I was spaced out in a chair. She was hammering, hammering. Construction work was going on. I was... Hey Bruce, was do you have like a, a, a favorite? One of the favorite hosts? Like some? Who do you enjoy writing for when it comes to hosting? You well, know, I truthfully, I enjoy, I enjoy all of them. But uh, um, Steve is my favorite. I mean, if there has to be a favorite, only because he's such an oddball. And his his worldview is so skewed, uh, you know. And, and and he will come up with things like uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which actually was uh, originally called Siegfried and Roy Vacation Movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to 
he's he's such an iconoclast and he's a huge movie star and so he he has the right to make fun of it all uh billy crystal is like a vaudevillian who does the, the billy crystal special we did uh, a, a monologue a medley we, we did uh, film clips we put him in all the movies i mean he's full service he's fabulous uh whoopie's hysterical so they're all i mean i uh, even letterman was fun except he was uh he was he's anguished whenever he works he's he he and Paul Linder, the two people I've worked with, who never have a good time unless they're they're working. They have a good time and they're working. The moment the light goes off, they start beating themselves up. Oh, Dave mm -hmm. just, you know, oh, that was terrible. It was awful. I couldn't. And then, you know, then he comes back and he's brilliant. And, yeah. But but he, but he, we did have a good time doing. It. He didn't have a good time. I mean, we were backstage at one point during the show, and I said, "How are you feeling?" And he said, "Like I'm in a, I'm in a hostage situation." <laughs> 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 so, every, spot team to get him out of there. so each year when you're getting ready to write for it did you actually watch all of the films nominated for best picture or did you just watch like yeah. some trailers and bs your way through it no i i, I actually watched all of them I, nice. I, I, mean, I go to the movies a lot and and uh when there were movies remember movies yeah. and, and then you know and now it, i mean they make it so easy for you i mean you download everything if you're an academy voter send it all to your home I, i'd rather see it in the movie uh you know popcorn and a soda my hand on somebody who doesn't know i'm there and <laughs> much more you know it's, it's i like the experience of being with all these strangers in the dark you yeah. know i mean that's the function that, that movies have i mean that's why they'll always be there and they have they have societal functions you know, it's a place to take a date. It's a place to go and be scared. A place to go and laugh. It's a safe place for all of those things, and that's why I can't wait for them to come back. So, long-winded answer. Yes, I I I watch them often. Uh, mm. when, so, like, when when the O.J. Simpson uh, trial was happening, I was interviewed, and they said uh, many people have said this is the trial of the century. Uh, what do you think is the trial of the century? And I said the English page. <laughs> <laughs> Can I use something else? Oh, I was just going to ask, like, hours. something, like, a thing that's been going around online, I've noticed a lot, where it's like, you know, worst case scenario, movie theaters never come back. Everybody wants to know, like, what is the last movie you would have seen in theaters? Wow. Uh, it was the, uh, the, 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 the um, Elizabeth Olsen, um, it wasn't the Escape Room or the Panic Room, it was a remake of a 34. Oh, The Invisible movie. Man? Invisible no. Man, that was what it was. Oh, Invisible Man. man. That was, I, I that was the last thing that. I saw in the theater. Elizabeth Moss. Before it clamped down. The, huh. And it was good. It was it was good. She was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to ask you a question. So considering this year and the Academy Awards, whatever they're going to look like, if you were to be asked to write the Academy Awards this year, what in the hell would you write about? <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that everybody watched these things uh, at home with no pants. I mean, <laughs> you would start with that. You would start how the audience experience changed this year. Uh, and I mean, not they, not all. I mean, I, they probably were wearing pants for uh, World Trolls World Tour, which did a hundred million dollars of people planting their kids who had not been able to go to a movie for mm -hmm. three months in front of the TV to watch Trolls, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or Mulan. Uh, but that, I mean, there, there would be actually this year, there would be a, a whole welter of stuff to talk about because it's not like, like no other year. I don't know what they're, I mean, they pushed back and I don't know if they're going to uh, try to go for a host or, or have no host or be virtual or do what the Emmys did. I mean, uh, I think they, they go there every day thinking, what are we going to do with this thing? And when are we going to open this fucking museum? Yeah. <laughs> They have we have, they have many balls in the air. Um, and before we jump into Star Wars stuff, I, I, I do want to ask a Hollywood Squares question. Um, yeah. for, I want to know. We kind of talked to you about like what it was like working with all the comedians and all these. Funny, what was it like just corralling like all these funny people into the Hollywood Squares and tr and writing for all them? You know, we shot thirty six days a year. We would do five shows a day. We would do a week and a day, and it would be chronological. So the first show we would do at ten o'clock in the morning would be the Monday show, and the last show we would do in the afternoon was the Friday show. During which time there had been lunch and lots of wine, 
So the last two shows were much looser than the other, the first three shows. <laughs> and in fact, but, but it seemed to, the audience seemed to like that because the people watching it on Friday wanted it to be more fun because they were coming into their weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and Monday was like, you know, they were as slow as we were. So it was, it worked out well. But because of, because of what you were a whole day with these people, it was a lot of fun. Everybody came, came staggering in in the morning, and I have to brief them all on what they were going to say, uh, what their questions were, and their, their bluff answers and their joke answers. You didn't tell them the real answer. I didn't know the real answer, because if the, if the contestants thought everybody knew the real answers, they would just agree with everything. There'd be no game. So, uh, so we had to tell, you know, Get, let them know what they were in for, and then we would uh, have breakfast and climb up into the squares. And it was a, just a lot of fun. And everybody was pretty much on good behavior because there were eight other people kind of going, hey, get up, you know. <laughs> you know I want to get home tonight. I want to get out of here. I'm tired of the retakes, you know. So people yeah. were uh, people were were pretty game and uh, and and even when they when they worked different angles on the thing you said, that's not exciting yeah, you know pretty, pretty, patty the bell like pretend she knew the answer and give them the wrong answer and you know, i said well you know they're just not going to call on you unless they have to. and since since you're up on the top left hand you're not a crucial square they're, they don't have to go through you unless they absolutely need you to win or block. They're going to leave you alone. The whole day long. <laughs> but they, they watch the show, the, the upcoming contestants, and they, they plot their strategies, too, and they they will avoid you. But you have to start by you know, being, yeah. being nicer to them. And uh, he sent me a, a something to bake, a sweet potato pie or something. He's a big cook. And my, my last out of the square question, and then I'm going to Kind of, we're gonna move into the other se session. Let the, everybody else take over. So, and, um, do you have any salacious dirt from the stars of the Hollywood Squares you can reveal to us without getting sued? Salacious dirt on um, that yeah, happened. Not, any stories that happened? Oh, uh, not really. Well, Friday I mentioned that, that the Friday we when we'd been drinking. Friday was a sometimes pantless Friday <laughs> where you. You, everybody would sit in the square with no pants. We would all make a pact, and we'd all we'd all climb up into our squares. And all your stuff at the top, and we would do little jokes about that. You know, that gerbils running loose and that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and then they they upped the ante on the game. They made it. Uh, they gave a bonus round, yeah. and if you won, you got the Mercedes or something. But the bonus round, he would choose the square, and that person would have to come down and do a separate thing on a, on a podium in front. So you had to wear pants. So that kind of put the kibosh on Pantless Friday. Aww. Well, I, I really did want to go down there with, you know, no pants and just a t-shirt <laughs> and answer Aww. questions seriously. But there were no, uh, uh, <laughs> there, there, I mean, there was nothing really, I wish if there, I wish there was, was something salacious, you know? I mean, there, <laughs> and there was no time. And you would Boom, boom, and I mean, there, was, there would be people would dance around the lunch, but no. The, the closest, I guess, is Anna Nicole Smith, who was really bombed. She was just really bombed. And, and at, after they, they stopped calling on her, because she was also, we moved her out of back to a square where she wouldn't get too much traffic, because she, she was in bad shape. She really didn't handle it. <laughs> really didn't handle it. Uh, All right. Yeah, you know, the only thing she said to me was, Ha! Can you get me a corkscrew? That was all she said to me all day long. And I think she meant to open the wine, but she may have meant something else. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that code? Uh, Girl, tell me. Uh, he's going to get us in trouble tonight. This is awesome. <laughs> but she was actually very, I mean, I did another benefit with her, and she was very warm. She mm -hmm. told me she was really scared that day because you know, this was, it was out of her comfort zone. So we are going to move into the part of the show that everybody is here for, the Star Wars Christmas Special 1978. I just got to tell Holiday you. Holiday Special. Please, we took the Christmas out of it. We're the ones. Who <laughs> it's all because of you, Bruce. It's a Star Wars Holiday Special. You know, that's was, right. That's right. Hanukkah. I don't think there was a Kwanzaa yet, but we were. George, George invented a holiday, Life Day. 
Yeah. So he didn't want it to be Christmas because Chewbacca was going back to Tekashik uh, to, to have a, a Life Day celebration. That was George's holiday. He was hoping it would kind of be like Festivus for the rest of us, but uh, not so much. But I understand they do a, they do a shout out to it in the Lego special. That's, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I've heard that 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 leaked out somewhere. So the well, Star Wars holiday special, the the Star Wars holiday special, of nineteen seventy eight. Everyone here recently right. watched it with either today, <laughs> yesterday, or the day before. So I'm okay. going to throw it over. Let's start with Ben. I'm going to throw it to the group. <laughs> okay, Bruce. We all love you. We love this gym here. right here. Here we go. Whatever, whatever. Let I, me I, I, apologize. I, uh, I'm gonna move by PBS earlier today, so I'm yeah. ready. I'm not. I'm. Uh, I'm not gonna rip you like PBS did. Those assholes. Um, <laughs> I. So I had never. I'm. I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan. I had never seen the holiday special because I'd always heard how terrible it was, and I would, you know, like don't watch it. It's 90 minutes of horror, and so I had two some hours this afternoon. <laughs> With a commercial. Well, with commercials, yeah. commercials give you gave you a chance to evacuate. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, you know, right now. And and so I watched this thing, and I actually one thing I really did appreciate about it was I sat there and thought of in the historical context, this was the first expansion on Star Wars. Like there yeah. was Star Wars, and then there was the holiday special. There were no books. There were no video games. There were no extra movies. There were no TV shows. There was no Mandalorian, which they also mentioned Life Day in the series premiere of The Mandalorian on Disney. That I, that I saw, yes. I yeah. thought I got to mention somewhere in there. Thanks. Warm, warmed yeah. my cockles. <laughs> uh, and and so I I was just thinking about it. I was like, oh, that that is kind of cool for me as a fan of, of the series to think this was the first that was extra. This was before Empire Strikes Back. This was before anything else. This was the first thing where we got another <laughs> glimpse. And mm -hmm. that glimpse started with 20 minutes of Wookiees talking to each other with no subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Just growling and roaring at each other with no discernible dialect. <laughs> did you write dialogue for that scene or did you just say the Wookiees roar at each other for 20 minutes? Uh, we had a story from George indicating what happened what, what he wanted to have happen but then we had to we had to bend it a little bit to uh, uh, to, to make it logically to make it logical uh, mm -hmm. to give the thing a narrative that makes sense and also of course to insert guest stars I mean I when George I don't think when George sold the thing I mean he Get it as a promotional device, but when he sold it, I think he, he didn't expect. He thought they'd make an original musical out of it. And I don't think he expected they were going to do a variety special. I don't think he really knew what variety specials were. I doubt that he had, that was in his world. Yeah. So, so he he had this story. He had a bunch of the stories, and he knew he was never going to make this movie. And and he had other stories that were already in the works. They just didn't appear. There was a novel called The Moat in God's Eye. I think that was one of his stories that uh -huh. was turned into a novel that was published shortly after the, the special was on. So there were other things in the works, um, but this was the first thing to actually show up, and it was kind of a placeholder. It was uh, because he hadn't started shooting the Empire yet. So it, he just wanted to kind of prime the pump and keep the characters going. The characters had all shown up on variety shows. I mean, they were on Donnie and Marie. I wrote a thing for them on Donnie and Marie. They were on uh, they were on two or three other shows. Maybe, I don't know, if there was a Sunny Share then, or there was somebody. There were other things that they, that they showed up on. But um, they, this was the first independent thing. So, is that what your question was? I forget. I'm so long with it. I, just, I was just asking it. if uh, you wrote 20 minutes of roaring. But, oh, uh, I wrote it. Well, yeah. Yeah, and it was terrible. I mean, we, one of the things we said was, I mean, the people, you have two two lightning fast appearances. One by Harrison with Chewbacca and one by Mark Hamill with more eyeliner than Zorro the Gay Blade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had so much eyeliner. And um, and they were very brief, and they were basically uh, Morris the explainer. They were setting up the plot, and mm -hmm. then there was this tender domestic scene that went on for fracking ever uh, at the house, broken up by like a sort of like part of Cirque du Soleil. These uh, 
a little trick that was in Cirque du Soleil doing that weird little thing that you had to be as stoned as I was to act. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then uh, Harvey Corman, you know, which which sort of immediately put it in variety special land. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was, but there had to be something we had to bring in our time, and we had to kind of get the thing moving. I mean, he it, he didn't have a that much of a story. Uh, and I think had he actually made a movie of this, well, it would have been way back uh, in the history of the of the, the canon, and he would have had. Uh, a lot of explaining, of, you know, a lot of uh, more in-depth stuff. But we wanted subtitles. We we argued, we lobbied for subtitles, and the network wouldn't let us because it's be hard to believe this. But 45 years ago, people wouldn't go to the movies with subtitles. Wow. They would go. The mm -hmm. Foreign pictures were dubbed, and they were uh, in the bigger markets. They got subtitles. The irony is that now any of the Star Wars movies of the second wave of Star Wars movies, half of the pictures were sub Lupita Nyong'o does not speak a word of English in any of those Star Wars movies. <laughs> Every <laughs> single line she has is dubbed, uh, is underneath. And, and I don't even think that she's saying the words in whatever language she's speaking. I think she's doing a mind performance. And uh, that shows you how different that That would never have been allowed, certainly not on, on a network TV back then. <laughs> if they'd let us do that, it would have been a whole different thing. Now, was this Go ahead. Uh, was this a follow-up to that? Go ahead, Ben. Well, I was just going to go on because you mentioned Harvey Corman, and I thought yeah. out of the... Obviously, Harvey Corman is so bizarre, and there was the whole like cooking show scene, and he had extra arms, and I was like, okay, I know what I'm for at this point. Like... Um, but then I thought actually Harrison Ford like showed up and committed to being the character of he was uh, good. one day. Yeah. And he, he just played the character like he plays them in the movies. Yeah. I was also shocked at Mark Hamill. I was just like, who put like, it was like bronzer and eyeliner yeah. and like you know, his makeup looked like it, me trying to do my own makeup in every stage show I was in in high school. Yeah, which uh, ties to my question. I, you know, I is, forgot until I saw it the other day. I thought, I thought, wow, how that happened? Yeah. Was I this mean, after the accident? So forest boy looking, and uh, I don't know. It was, uh, you know, he was aware. So yeah, did it have to do with the accident? Because I know he got in a car accident where he had to have the plastic surgery and it, other stuff. The accident was after this, I think. Yeah, oh, it was but after. Totally after. Yeah, I mean, this this is the old Mark Face, I think. Yeah, I mean, okay. the original, because um, he had to have a lot of reconstruction and uh, uh, and look different. Yeah, mm -hmm. Samlings, Derek, and Danae, you guys, I, I know Derek. I was you were texting me today while you were watching it and sending me videos. Yeah, so I, I had seen moments before, and that was about it. I had found it on YouTube and watching it this time. It was, yeah, it was what I was wanting actually. Um, yeah, it, that was, that was, it was what I was in the mood for and it hit the spot. Um, my wife was watching with me. I was, my wife ran off to the chiropractor this afternoon and I was about to start it. And there was that little scene on the millennium Falcon. And I'm like, no, Laura needs to see this too, because I do not want her to miss it. Um, and then our, you know, we've got three foster kids right now and the ones who were napping woke up during watching it. And I realized, I hope no one in the foster system knows that we're giving these kids this as their first exposure to Star Wars because they'll take them away from us. Um, <laughs> you mean they haven't but, seen any of the other things that are about? no, like these kids are three and under. They're really oh, little. Okay. Yeah, not but even we were watching Fett, it, which which is what it's really known for. Uh, the perfect daughter. Other than being bad, it's known for introducing Bubba Fett to the. Yeah, kids. wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Let me show you something. I've got, I've actually got the Star. Okay. Wars. That's cool. Was, see, I, I got this at Star Wars Celebration, the, the lunchbox of the Star, Star Wars Holiday Special with Boba Fett. Oh, wow. It was great. I thought it was awesome. That I, Luke, you were talking. That cartoon was actually – did you guys yeah, write that? that was great. Great. I mean, you know, George did the cartoon, and it, I thought it was it was worth the price of admission, I guess. But yeah. you know, the, the, the thing of it is, uh, the two things I've always said is, uh, we, it was 1978. We were all chemically altered, <laughs> <laughs> including including huge swaths of the audience. I was like, <laughs> number one. And if we'd known that we would be talking about this 45 years later, we would have paid closer attention. Yeah. 
But it was it was just another idiotic television special that that were was being put together. There were lots of them at the time yep. that were just you can't believe how foolish they were. And so it it, it didn't strike anybody. It was, I mean, we thought it was kind of unusual. And when it came and it got a decent rating and it and it you know some reviews said it was okay and some of them hated it and and it went away. And then it got discovered when the internet came in. Because they were were like, because George George immediately clamped down and tried to buy up every copy and didn't want, and then the internet came in. And a lot of people who had never heard about it discovered it by accident on the internet. And at that point, the first three movies were out and Star Wars had become like Scientology. It was like like a religion. It was a religion you paid for. It was a religion. And George began getting like death threats from people saying, How could you do this? How could you do this to, to this beautiful work that you this canon you've created, this saga, and on and on and on. And so George, of course, kind of panicked and really wanted it destroyed. And uh, and subsequent generations who have who watched who've only seen the original movies on VHS or DVD or something like that. Um, come across this thing and they feel the same way. And now, but every time there is a new Star Wars, ever since he came back and did The Phantom Menace, every one of those movies, including Rebel One and Solo, every time they come out, somebody calls and says, can we talk about that Star Wars holiday special? (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, it, it just didn't go away because of the internet. It's like, you know, what can I say? Yeah. Well, well, I, I was bad on this. For? Didn't he invent the internet? Or was that, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm with Ben on this. Like, watching it, I thought, okay, yeah, this is just a year and a half after the release of the original Star Wars. It's a year and a half before The Empire Strikes Back was going to be out. And nobody at that point really knew where Star Wars was going to go, that's, obviously. That's awesome. And you can tell, like, the way the animated part goes and the way so many things were there, like, expanding in the world for the first time. You know, they didn't really know... I mean, the people who, like, even George Lucas didn't know everything that was going to come. And, of course, you guys as the writers weren't going to know everything that was going to come up. The production design people, um, even the people trying to market this, the people who are hiring guest stars, you know, they were trying to put together, like you said, a variety show based on a property that was available. Nobody ever, uh, in in, in the book I'm writing about how I wrote the worst television shows in history and lived, uh, (laughs) I I mentioned that at the time, uh, people either forget or they're too young to know that Star Wars was like, it was a phenomenon, but it was like a, a, a Republic Studios serial. I mean, it, it keeps, re- keeps referencing all of these old Hollywood tropes, and, or like you know, Buck Rogers from the old days and Captain Video. All those things are in there. And uh, so it wasn't considered high art. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, was, it was a popular thing. That was, that was all it was. It wasn't it, it achieved all of the things we're talking about later as it got built up over generations. That's so kind the of crime, how the crime evidently got worse as, as we went. <laughs> it was just a, a misdemeanor when we did it. Now it's a felony. <laughs> I'll never, I can never vote except in Georgia where anybody can vote. So. <laughs> Ask then, Lily Graham, he'll tell you. <laughs> I mean, that kind of matches with like my thoughts on it because, you know, it was 1978 and it's, you know, I don't watch Adam West Batman and expect it to be like Christian Bale Batman. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's like, it's it's all still Batman though and I still love it. It's like, you know, it's it's just just another section of something that we love. That doesn't mean we have to hate it just because it's different. Yeah, no, I I enjoyed myself. I enjoyed myself while I watched it, even though it is pretty bad uh <laughs> it's draggy it's draggy draggy and clunky how my how my director called draggy and clunky it's yeah. it, it, it moves it, it moves laboriously because of the structure because it has to be it's serving so many masters it has to be a variety show that stuff has to be shoehorned into this kind of nonsensical story that's no real narrative i mean it's it will will chewbacca get home in time for life day and he's yeah, being chased, yeah. and he stops at on on Tatooine to to go to visit Mos Eisley, who turns out to be B. Arthur. <laughs> and, uh, all these things that that's basically what happens. So um, it's it's a lot of rehash of stuff. So, and so of course, it, there's no pacing to the thing at all. 
Right. Well, one of my and, favorite things was Art Carney was great in this. I really enjoyed watching his character. And then one of the first things he does is he just brings the grandpa like virtual reality porn. That's right. That was George. Yeah, that was George had it with had VR. He had uh, this is the idea of a helmet you put on and it plugs into your brain waves and uh, and and there's Diane Carroll. So yeah, why not? With the book, so that was really when you can think about it. It was the first interracial, interspecies romance on television. <laughs> That's true. We started the Star Wars breaking barriers. <laughs> but I mean, that scene that he's talking about, though. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't. I, I was one of the few people. I'm old enough in this. I saw this special on television when it first aired. I remember that I was a little kid. I don't remember that Diane Carroll scene, and it was like Itchy, Uncle, you know, Grandpa Itchy, popped some drug, put on the screen, and was basically it was porn. <laughs> it was watching something. It was, was, yeah. It was the kind of soft core porn. It was supposed <laughs> to be Cher, and Cher got Cher got sick and she couldn't do it. And oh, Diane stepped <laughs> and, and then I thought Diane made it more more interesting because she was Diane Carroll, and she was so. I mean, there's an exoticism to her because, I mean, she was just, you know, because yeah. she's not rock and roll and she's she's tempting and, uh, you know, a different type altogether. And I thought that's great for this. It was great for us because, uh, you know, we were dealing in a universe of all different kinds of creatures. Mm -hmm. And all the, all the people we had on the show were white guys, you know. Yeah. And so, okay, here's something different. She's a different kind of, of creature. Ben, did I step on your question? Did you were you asking a question? Did I step? Mm, no, I don't okay. think so. I know, Luke. You actually did mention kind of what Bruce was talking about, like when we were watching it yesterday. Because Luke says, you know, if somebody had taken, if an editor got a hold of this and just kind of cut out, what were you saying, Luke? Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of good, like, heartwarming sections or sections that just feel cool in classic Star Wars. I feel like if it, there was, like, an edited down version to, like, an hour or half an hour type thing with the best of moments, I feel like it would feel good and feel Star Wars and feel very holiday. There were there were two directors, and that probably had something to do with it. The first director, David Akumba, who was George's roommate in college, uh, was a, a very talented Canadian who came down and did it, but he was shooting it like it was a movie. Uh, you know, on television in the variety show, the director basically is in the booth calling camera shots. David was on the floor moving around with cameras, and, and it, it was going to cost a fortune to edit it, and, and everything would take forever to shoot that way. And we did this was not you know, CGI and all of that. These were actually real, real people in those costumes. So uh, it was, he finally, they had a big, a big fall out, and he left. And oh, Steve Binder, yeah. who was a big variety TV guy who really knew how to do it, and uh, came in and, and finished it, and did in fact the majority of it. So there was, a, there was probably moments of tone, the things you're talking about made in the early stuff, felt more like the movie than, uh, than TV. And we have a question here from uh, Jonathan Wilkinson, which kind of leads into another question. Jonathan said, yeah. Boba Fett is to the Star, War is to Star Wars uh, holiday special as meatloaf is to Rocky Horror Picture Show. Do you? I does that. <laughs> well, I, I think I, it, he's saying that this was like a, a, a guest star from another universe who was jobbed in. Yeah, I mean, meatloaf was meatloaf before Rocky Horror, mm -hmm. and uh, and and but that was that he was playing a character that was played by somebody else when they did it on stage in London mm -hmm. and in, uh, and in New York and out here. Um, so, uh, uh, but I think they maybe they cast him because he was meatloaf and because he had a personal following. Yeah. So I, I think that's what you're thinking, yeah. But you know, Bubba Fett was unknown at the time. Bubba right. Fett was uh, it was George's. George wanted to do a full length animated feature of Bubba Fett, and he couldn't make it happen. So he took this thing and, and inserted it in the Star Wars. Show. <laughs> so it's not exactly the analogy isn't exactly the same, but I I know where you're going with it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, go ahead, Ben. Well, I was just going to say Boba Fett, if you watch, so in 97, when the special edition came out, they added back in that scene in A New Hope with uh, Jabba the Hutt waiting at the Millennium Falcon, uh, and Han Solo goes in, and Boba Fett is in the background of that scene. 
Ah. You know, the, in the full costume. So he had showed up, but they cut that scene out of the original and he never showed up. So this was his first appearance. Uh -huh. um, yeah. I remember uh, <laughs> telling, telling us that about um, this new character who I'm going to spring on. One of, the, one of the great things is I was up in Burbank many years ago and there was, there was a shop up there that had a lot of vintage magazines and books and VHS tapes and posters. Um, and I can't remember what the name of it was. It was something like movie world or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was, uh, that was a great store. You know, Cause of COVID. I remember that story. Yeah. <laughs> in the before time. Uh, but, of a railroad track and there's the story. So uh, yeah, I was in there many years ago and I, I pulled, um, like a science fiction fan magazine off the shelf from like 1978, 1979. And I was leafing through and there was an article about star Wars and it was the exact same thing that people do on the internet today. It was this guy writing an article of what he thought was going to happen or should happen uh -huh. in the next star Wars. Movie. Yeah, yeah. And I remember him writing about, you know, I think, uh, you know, this Luke Skywalker character, he's probably going to take a back seat. Han Solo is going to become the main character in the in the new storyline. This Darth Vader, he's he's probably going to fall by the side. And we've heard of this character named Boba Fett. He's going to come in. He's probably going to be the new big bad. And it just cracks me up to look back and think of all these people speculating like they do now on the Internet about all of the different things that are coming out back in the 80s in magazines and mm -hmm. How wrong they all were. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I do a hand at creating some of that <laughs> yeah. universe. Uh -huh. Who would see the father thing coming? <laughs> <laughs> so, Bruce, I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. I, we're going to move on to uh, um, some the next topic here, which is the new Star Wars thing. But I do have to ask you this question, and it kind of tags on to what Jonathan said about Boba Fett and me. Rocky Horror Picture Show. I guess this Star, the Star Wars Holiday Special, has, you know, as weird and bizarre as it is, it's somehow taken on this almost mythic underground status, mm -hmm. much in the same way that Rocky Horror has. You know, it's people and, and like people are rediscovering it, and people are kind of it's kind of like a, a mark of pride. Like, yeah, I saw it, I saw it, and, and, and to be able to talk about it. So if I were to what to what do you attribute this? How is it able? What do you think is it about this special that forty five years later it's now this underground cult classic? Well, I think it's um, probably the, the essence of camp. It's the failed seriousness, except that w that we really weren't trying to be serious. Uh, so, that, but we're campy nevertheless. I think it's because uh, it, it's it's grown in the reputation of being so awful. <laughs> that uh, it's so bad it's good that you have to well you can't believe what they did it and because star wars is, has become a religion you know it's it's like uh it's like the ten commandments you know, <laughs> which is hysterical i mean i'm jewish and every year i think you know at, at easter all my gentile friends watch charlton heston climbing climbing mount sinai <laughs> what the hell is that <laughs> even when the picture came out the jews we went to it and said what's that <laughs> Let me <laughs> He's the king of the Jews, Charlton Heston. What? <laughs> Edward G. Robinson? Edward G. Well, he happened to be Jewish, but Edward G. Robinson was like the, the breakaway. I mean, it was like, this is so bad, it's delightful. And of course, Ten Commandments has never gone away either. It's one of those things that's on every year at Easter Day. That and the sound of music they fling at you every year. So um I, I think it's it's right up there with those tragedies. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's, I mean, to add to the, the luster of it is it's underground. Yeah. It was something that people had to find. It wasn't intended to be seen by anybody once it aired that night in, in 1978. Uh, and, and the people can dig it up and say, ooh, you know, this thing, this was the secret thing. The thing we were supposed to know. Nobody's supposed to know about this. I mean, it's 45 years later. Everybody knows about it. But... <laughs> You know, there are still some people who like to who, who trade in that traffic and that kind of stuff. So that's probably why it's uh, it's 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 maintained its its position in the pantheon of cult classics. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. I think the fact that you're not supposed to see it and you have to dig for it to find it right. 
makes it all the more alluring. And the the video on YouTube that I watched was it was a, a upload from a VHS tape where they had taped it off TV, and the opening of it is that CBS special presentation with the, the black background around. Yeah. yeah, like the neon letters, and it's like dunk, 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 yeah. and it looks, it looks like a pinwheel, like an mm -hmm. exactly. And <laughs> I just remember I that I must have done this. Yeah, that I am. It, I am was something else. That's international <laughs> men of leather. They didn't do this, but <laughs> ILM. <laughs> uh, I've, I've done shows there. I know it's hysterical. Um, <laughs> then I go the next morning for the ritual burning of the linen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. That a question? <laughs> I don't even remember at this point. <laughs> oh, yeah. have, um, any other thoughts on um, the 1970 Star Wars uh, Star Wars holiday special before we move on to the 2020 version? All right, go, All right. Derek first, and oh no, Luke first, and then Derek. Oh. Luke um, yeah, I'm brushing my hair back, but I do have thoughts. So Luke, yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, my question is like, what is your favorite thing you wrote on it? Like, yeah. what was your favorite part? That, that's a very good question. Because I'm trying to remember what exactly I did <laughs> right on it. And it was maybe something, probably something with Harvey and B is all I can, yeah. can think yeah. of. Uh, because those were, those were two pals of mine. And, uh, and I had written a lot of stuff for them on other things. So I think it's probably, it's probably that. And, and it was a chance to be funny. And, um, and I haven't, I mean, some of it's funny, some of it is, it's hit and miss. And, you know, the thing of, uh, um, as I've said, the, the thing with Harvey doing Julia Child, it was it was a one joke thing, but I mean, we were really, uh, we were locked into something that had to be kind of galactic. And so to have him do Julia Child as an alien was, was a funny look, but you couldn't really build on it. You know, when Dan Aykroyd did Julia Child, the idea was, what if Julia Child cut her finger and bled to death during a cooking demonstration? Yeah. And so that's an idea. That has a beginning, a middle, and an end. This mm -hmm. had no idea. It was just like, let's put him something with seven arms and have him cooking and doing little jokes about, about what he's cooking. And it lasted. And then they kept cutting away to Mala trying to do this stuff, you know. Yeah. The Wookiee, yeah. with, you know, I don't know with, whether or not she has opposable thumbs. We never figured out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you know, we were we were hamstrung a lot by what by, by what we had to do and had to move the plot along and and um, B had to be strong. You know, she was in her Statue of Liberty mode, and uh, she couldn't be terribly caustic. She was Maud at the time. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so Bach and Trade was coming in with the zingers. And God will get you, Walter, and that kind of stuff. And uh, and she couldn't really do that there. And she only was there. She wanted to sing a very serious song. She wanted. She brought in a breath song. She wanted to sing. By she said this by Kurt Vile and Bertolt Brecht. She said actually it was the Alabama song. You you may know it. Frank Zappa did it. Oh, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. And it had an underground following. And she wanted to do that. And Bertolt Brecht's estate said no. <laughs> Bertolt Brecht did not write this song to be sung at the cantina on Tassie with a bunch of aliens, you know, with with the uh, scotch tape and Elmer's glue all keeping them their heads together. So they, they were kind of we cut rate right aliens. We couldn't use the real ones. We had to use what was left in the warehouse. <laughs> now speaking of the cantina, just real quick. So there's. That guy, like that, was just in love with the bartender. Like, do you think in the end he got her, or do you think that was just a short little moment, the little heartbreak that guy went through, feeling all lovesick about her? That was Harvey yeah. in the bar, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think he got her. I think, uh, I think probably somebody zapped him on the way out, or <laughs> probably. <laughs> Whatever was, the, whatever was in the whatever was in the the Bantu drink or whatever they call it. <laughs> Derek, you had a question. Yeah, the, well, I, that cost, the drink that cost twenty five bucks at Disneyland. <laughs> yeah. mm. Oh, that's the cheap one. Yeah, no, that's, yeah exactly. That's the blue one with the with the, the dry mm -hmm. eyes. Yeah. Um, oh, sure, though. Yeah, that most Eisley scene. Like yeah, I was have commenting. You, have you ever been to the pop up bar on Hollywood Boulevard? The, yeah. Uh, 
the scavenger hunt. I think it's permanent, right? Yeah, it's permanent. Think, yeah, it started to pop up, and it became permanent. A friend of mine had a birthday party there, and uh, <laughs> and it was, it was it was a lot of fun. It was I mean, you know, expensive blueprints, things like that. Yeah, it was cool. But I, yeah, I've I've been there gone, once. Gone now, but maybe it'll I was there. Better. I was there right as COVID was getting started, and like ah. things weren't totally locked down yet, but nobody was going out, so I was able to get easy street parking. And really? yeah, exactly. Just walked in, parking in Hollywood, man. That's... Yeah, and it was like a Saturday morning. You know, I met up with some buddies, had a little brunch there. Yeah. Oh, oh I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Question. Great. Oh no, I was gonna comment. Like, it's amazing how uh, relevant that Mos Eisley scene was now, yeah. just because she's like, the Empire's closing us down. There's a curfew. Everybody's got to go. And, yeah. like, and I feel like, you. Oh, we want to drink some more. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Well, and then right. later, the team, no, just it really got me when you had a stormtrooper that picks up Lumpy's stuffed bantha and tears the head off. Oh, I know. For no apparent reason that I could see. Like he was searching for something, or maybe he thought oh, Chewbacca. They are, yeah, they are. Uh, they're after Rebel scum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they they're tipped off that there are some in the bar. So. Yeah, and that that scene played right after all of the kids had woken up. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, since we're going to kind of go through the, the end here because we um, it just dropped today the sequel to the 1978 Star Wars Holiday Special is the Lego. What, what's the full name? The Lego Star Wars Holiday Special. special yeah. All right. And so, Bruce, you have not seen it yet. No, I haven't. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see it. Oh, and Ben has not seen it. I've only Did seen a trailer. Have, okay. Danae, have you seen it? I was able to catch some pieces. Me and Luke watched the whole thing. Appropriate so, for a Lego thing. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say. Lego pieces. What pieces did you like? Um. Uh. Well, like I really loved Baby Yoda. I was texting. Um. I had to take my car in today, so I had. I mean, we're always going to love Baby Yoda. I was texting <laughs> for some help with a couple of my friends who watched it. One of them who actually, um, I have to say, she is a huge fan of the Star Wars Christmas special. I told her that we were going to be talking about it tonight, and she was like, "Don't make fun of it. It's amazing." <laughs> um. But yeah. yeah, she loves it. Um. I really love the fact that it's just, I mean, that's the thing with like the Lego, like any Lego film, they know how to just be silly and have fun with it. And I think they really embrace that in the best possible way. Um, Yeah. I think my favorite part though, was Poe wearing a BB-8 Christmas sweater. Yeah. Might have been the best. Yeah. Cheeseman, you saw the whole thing. what do you think? I think it was a lot of fun. Um, First of all, I just want to thank Dan Lin who, I used to intern for his company, but he really brought the Lego and the sense of humor of Lego and being this big kind of on-screen presence with Lego. And I I don't think he was tied to this in any way, but kind of created kind of the humor with the Lego thing. But it kind of continued through this, and I just thought it was really... And Lin produced the very first and second and the third... Yeah, the Lego movies. Like, he brought kind of Lego to the mainstream. I know there's the Lego stuff. Yeah. they were really I'm well making done. notes, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I, I feel like spell Lego. Q seven purple five. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like the the time jumping and the characters and the parody it did of itself. I mean, like it had kind of like you know like a Family Guy would do, but you know Family Guy has its own kind of humor, but it really knew how to kind of like poke at itself and have fun with it and bringing in the different characters and getting to see. A small spoiler, but like uh, Kylo Ren getting to see Grandpa Darth Vader and all yeah. that was kind of a cool moment. It was cool. They were able to jump through time. I, I saw it as well. And they did all the time jumps and they even had some, they, an attempt at like heartfelt moments. And I thought it kind of felt good, but it was overall just very well done. It was funny. And um, there wasn't a much to There was uh, uh, Grandpa Itchy was out there ro- playing in the snow. Remember? He was back. Everybody, it was cool. Yeah, some of the holiday special characters back, mm-hmm. especially Chewbacca. They, uh, the, the Chewbacca family. Yes, mm-hmm. back. they're all back. Yeah. The uh, thing now was, I have to watch it. Just have to watch it. Just see what Itchy and Lumpy do. <laughs> I don't think Lumpy had very big of a part. <laughs> I, I Lumpy, Lumpy is like Bart Simpson's, never grown. It's just the same. Right. 
Exactly. Forty yeah. years later, he's the same. Yeah. Are, are itchy and lumpy? Before. Are itchy and lumpy like shortened versions of their names? Like Chewy. Yeah. I was wondering that too. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Itchy's name is Atitichuk. Uh, oh. Okay. Uh, Atitichuk, and so uh, they call him Itchy, so you don't confuse him with a Mongol emperor. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lumpy actually had two names: Lumpa Rumpa uh, Wama. And some, but sometimes it would appear in the story as Lumpa Wumpa Waru. Oh. As I said, that's his name in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, um, and the story, we read the story, it says, is this the same? Is there another lump character or is this the same lump? I mean, how many lumps do they have? One lump or two. <laughs> but those are actually the real, and Mala's real name is, is, uh, 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 Mala, it's a, it's a Mala, Mala, Mala Donna, something, something, something. You know how all the names in the universe have two, two consonants when there could be one, and three <laughs> vowels, and you know that's it's like Hawaiian. <laughs> it's like speaking Hawaiian. That's the same. It's kind of the same when you put it together. And I also, I don't know what well, that's. I guess that's Hashik language. But it translates to every other uh, part of the galaxy, which is a neat trick. But you know, <laughs> it is neat. But the, I did enjoy the, the the Lego special. The the thing that was so clever is the, uh, there was a time travel element. I don't want to ruin it for for those of you who haven't seen it yet, which allowed them. I know I'm not giving away, but it allowed Ray to basically uh, <laughs> to basically visit every part of the Star Wars universe, every well, bit of canon. You. Everyone, and it was cool. Done, Ben. Those, done. Those, those, Lego, those Lego movies are really clever. They're really clever yeah. and funny, and they're hip. And they're, yeah, they're they're. It's the other thing. This um, that is designed. The stuff now is designed for people who for parents who are hipper than our parents were. <laughs> you know, what I, I mean, they were like you know people my age. I mean, the, and I mean, but younger than me. I mean, they were. They grew up in a much kind of uh, a different, snarkier kind of, of uh, humor was prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they use in those movies because that's what that audience relates to. And our stuff was really still being written in the era of kind of vaudeville sitcom. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Jonathan Wilkinson had a comment. He says, yeah, his last name is Wilkinson, but his whole second last name is Wilkinson, son of a bitch. <laughs> Now, well, concerned with that. Well, we'll only, use, only used by his neighbors when he rehearses the drum solos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. As we do kind of draw to a close here, I want to see if anybody else has any kind of last thoughts on 1978 version, 2020 version, or any questions. I, I just have a couple last questions for, for Amy Schumer here. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, that 19, the 1978 version is definitely the best Star Wars holiday special I have ever watched. Oh my um, God! Well, now you're going to have Lego people, you know, stalking. Yeah, so, I mean, it's got to at least be in the top two of ones that are out there. So, <laughs> that that's I'll an achievement. That. Yeah, I'll drink to that. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. Um, and, and then and then I'll go back to Danae. But like, Bruce, forty five years later, what's your personal assessment of the 1978 Star Wars Holiday Special? Uh, well, I, I think, as I said before, if we'd known we were going to be talking about it, we would have paid closer attention. <laughs> it's it's one of these disposable things that comes back and you go, well, what's that? How does that, that marry to today? And it got, to, I mean, I, I wish there was something, that, some perfect analogy of something that, that started out sort of small and inconsequential and ruined as something monstrous. Maybe Donald Trump. That's a good analogy. <laughs> I mean, you know, when he appeared on the scene, he was kind of a harmless and funny in a reality show. And who knew he was going to end American democracy? He was in um, Home Alone 2 as well. Yeah, Home Alone 2. He was in Home Alone 1. Home Alone 2. What? I mean, he wasn't even in the original. Yeah. Right. Home Alone 2 lost in New York. This is how <laughs> down market he is. <laughs> well. So uh, any other closing remarks, guys, before we let Bruce go? Did you get to keep anything from set or any kind of prop or the original scripts or anything from making this special? I, I do have the scripts. They have gone to the Smithsonian. 
No, not uh, well. They, if they ask, they will. I mean, some of them I sent over to. There's a collection at Ohio State where I went. That <gasps> wait, uh, what? You went to Ohio State? I went to Ohio State. <laughs> what? A H I A. Aha! Look at that. Big farm. Yes. I'm a really. Oh my God! Are you a Buckeye? Yeah. Uh, my mom was, but I went to art school in Columbus. But I'm I lived in Columbus, Ohio, before I moved to L.A. Do Albany, Ohio, actually. Oh my God! I know, know very well. I was five years. I was there, hmm. and, and getting two different degrees. I loved no it, but it was way. It was so different. You know, when I lived there, the short north was what your life was if you walked down those streets at night. <laughs> now it's trendy gay neighborhood, the short north between. Campus and downtown Columbus. There was a, a DMV that you just mm -hmm. didn't go into, unless your you know name was, was Shaniqua and you were selling something. I mean, you just didn't go in. <laughs> Stay away. Ben, you had now a it's a whole different thing. Now, yeah. Columbus. I mean, tech tech changed Columbus a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, tech moved in and diversity happened and a lot of stuff. And now they have a major league team. They have a hockey team. So. Blue Jackets? Blue Jackets, there you go. We OSU was the major league team. It was the only major league team. Yeah, that's, yeah. Why, that's why there was so much rabid support. Because Still is in my team. mind. <laughs> <laughs> ben, you Did had a question? Michigan this year? That's all I am. That's all I know. Exactly. Yeah, I was just going to say, as a, as a kid who grew up, I was the youngest kid of old parents. And yeah. I... I grew up watching a lot of reruns of old variety shows and the Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island and eight, you know, seventies TV and eighties TV and a, grew up a big star Wars fan. And as I watched talk shows, you know, Letterman and Leno and Carson and, and Conan and all these guys in the nineties, the, the name Bruce Valanche always came up randomly in random places wow. uh, as I was watching television and, and uh, movies and, and things like that. And so, uh, you know, tonight to, to combine that with my appreciation for the universe of Star Wars, my as an actor and a writer myself for the appreciation of filmmaking and writing, uh, it's just been an honor and a pleasure talking with you tonight. And you've made me laugh so much and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. Happy, happy to do it, delighted. You're a great group. Uh, I, I, I concur, Bruce. I, I, I miss, even though I know people consider it a little bit less sophisticated, I miss the days of variety shows and, and corny and, and corny guests coming on and telling silly jokes and stuff like that. I mean, what what changed? What's different between... Well, what, changed, what, what changed was uh, <clears throat> commercial television. That was all commercial mm -hmm. television. And cable came in. And... Yeah. Uh, and then much, much later streaming. But once cable came in, it ended because uh, you could say anything you wanted to say on cable. And uh, the network, the only place you could do that on the network was SNL. And even then you were, you were towing the line. Now it's gotten, SNL does whatever they want. And the other shows any, come along, they basically can do, do it as well. But uh, there was no, there was no longer any home for that kind of stuff because people wanted outrage and they wanted the, they wanted cutting edge and that was all kind of like old school and uh, so it, it kind of drifted away and also the kind of people who would front a show like that um, are, are are not thick on the ground you know where's Carol Burnett you know where are these where where is somebody who can actually do a show like that and that's and. Uh, this is from somebody we try, we've tried to pitch shows like this. You know, Nathan Lane death, was desperate to do a variety show. Yeah. And they just wouldn't buy him. He did three failed sitcoms. Yeah. And we kept saying, put him in a variety show. He's the guy. He can make, he can cover the waterfront on this stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because he's got the attitude. And, uh, you know, we just couldn't. Stop. But people tried. Dana Carvey tried. You know, Maya Rudolph and Marty Short tried a show. It's just, it's, the ship sailed, I think, yeah. on that kind of thing. Well, it was announced today that Conan is, and Jonathan Wilkinson's reminding us of this. Hey, Conan yeah. is moving to HBO for his own variety show, Ben. <laughs> if you didn't my, know. my camera yeah. died, and so I'm frozen on the screen, but I'm still here. Yeah, I know. Very pleasant. Oh, he's doing HBO Max. It's, yeah, HBO Max. That's right. HBO that's right. Max, so you can stream it anytime. So it, it's uh, it's another animal, you know. It's, uh, yeah. And, and I love that Ben's 
picture is frozen with this look on his face. I know, this, this, <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, right. It's very I like that. I, I think mm -hmm. we could end the show on that. That's, wait, wait, like wait. Someone's doing something to him off camera that's very pleasurable. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, either that or I've got a giant bong just off screen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Bruce, one last that's question. That's a cleaned up version of what I was talking about. Jonathan Wilkinson has asked this question a couple of times and we, we, we didn't get it in, but he, he wants to know, did you enjoy Fanboys with a Z? Did you see it? No, I didn't. I, I didn't. Does anyone know what that is? I don't know what that is. Yeah, what the is movie it? Fanboys. It's about a bunch of Star Wars fans. By Adam who... S. Goldberg. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, for... I always forget that because uh, I love him. Um, yeah. But it's it's a group of guys before the prequel trilogy is ever out. Like these guys, ah. one of their friends is dying of cancer. And so they put this whole plot together to break into Skywalker Ranch and get a look at a cut of The Phantom Menace before it's released. I've heard about it. I haven't yeah. seen it. I've heard about it. Right. It's fun. It's got like a bunch of big cameos from different people. Like William spoke? Shatner shows up in one scene and Carrie Fisher's in another scene. And Seth Rogen's in it. Um, yeah. The kid who played McLovin. I can never remember his name. <laughs> there I am. Hey, Bruce, thank you so much for appearing oh, with us. Thank you. It's been such right. a pleasure. Before you go, though, you say, is there anything you want to promote? You say you're working on a book? I've got, yeah, I'm working a book when I'm, well, I'll come back when I've got the book so I can, you know, hector people into the Yeah, yeah. Me too. No, I got, I got nothing. That's not easy work. I'm working a lot, but nothing to promote at the moment. So. All right. So, well, we just appreciate here, you pantsless coming pantsless on typing. and so, go, I'm sorry. I'm sitting here pantsless typing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any, <laughs> any messages tonight. to the Academy? That was the rule for tonight. <laughs> Nobody could wear pants. So, Bruce, thank you so much for coming on to the Con Guy Show tonight. We hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you enjoy the show, just like us, follow us, check us out at theconguy.com. Who else do we have, and where can we find you, Danae? Um, well, um, I'm Danae. I'm a writer. I just wanted to show – I've got, finally, a copy of my book to show off now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Came in, and I'm so excited about it. Point of Hell, Retelling of Persephone in Early America. Um, but, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at D-N-A-Y-S. All right. Cheese? I'm Cheeseman. You can find me here at Cheese on Couch, both on Instagram and Twitter. You can find me on The Con Guy and The Scare Guy, the websites and the social medias. All right. Uh, Derek. Uh, hi, I'm Derek. Uh, you can find me here on The Con Guy. You can find me on The Scare Guy. And other than that, if you can find me, then I've made a mistake. All right. <laughs> and before we head to Ben, uh, Bruce or Amy, uh, do you, if people want to find out about what's going on with you or hearing you, the talk best is to go. There's a website called wegotbruce.com. We got Bruce.com. We got Bruce.com that tells everything about me. It's run by a fan in uh, in Florida, and it, uh, it, it he knows more than what I'm doing than what I'm doing. And, and you can leave a message for me there, and it'll get to me. Fantastic. And last but certainly not least, we. Oh wait, wait. Oh. <laughs> Ryan celebrating the Mandalorian. Oh, baby. <laughs> Bruce, for context, this is our friend Ryan who loves the Mandalorian, and that was his dance the uh, first day that the um, season two came out. Yep. Well, the trailer out. for season two. I you think know, they, it was they, really... they took a baby Yoda in SpaceX. You know that? I saw that. Yeah. Oh, I really? know. That was, as they <laughs> use it to test gravity. So they, they nice. bring some other artifact up every time, and this time with Baby Yoda. That's, That's amazing. And those right. Disney marketing people, boom, boom, boom. Oh, they're 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 space, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Next thing, there'll be seven dwarfs coming overhead. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, Ben. Hey, everybody. It's me, old buddy Ben Cleaver, looking like I'm taking drugs and being gratified. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at B E N K L I E W E R. And remember, you can't see it right now, but I am drinking out of this red cup. And that's because whenever Ben Cleaver shows up, it's always a party. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, everybody. I'm, I'm, just, I'm sitting on a Beaver Cleaver joke, but I won't go near it. <laughs> it's a oh, very old reference. And, and I can't. I can't. All right. June, anyway, my wife and I, I like are David David. our daughter, June. Bruce, it's been awesome tonight. This June, been you were very, you were rough on the Beaver yesterday. <laughs> All right, everybody, the favorite line right. of dialogue from Leave It to Beaver. We this. Um, All right. right, see you later, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.